Singularity. My name is Nicola and you're watching Singularity FM, the place where we interview the future. If you guys enjoy this podcast, you can help me make it better in one of two ways. Number one is you can go and write a brief review on iTunes. Or number two is you can go to interviewthefuture.com and simply make a donation. Today, my guests on the show are Laura Major and Julie Shah. Laura Major is CTO of Motional, previously Hyundai Aptiv Autonomous Driving Joint Venture, where she leads the development of autonomous vehicles. Previously, she also led the development of autonomous aerial vehicles at Sci-Fi, uh, which is a division at Draper Laboratory. Uh, and basically, just for clarity, those autonomous aerial vehicles are basically tethered drones, if I get this right. Is that correct, Laura? That's correct. But Sci-Fi is not a part of Draper. Sci-Fi was uh, one position that I held, and, I, and then I was a division leader at Draper Laboratory as a separate part of my career. Okay, I apologize. My bad. I'm just reading here the, the bio that, that your PR person shared with me. So I apologize for that. But Julie Shah is a roboticist at MIT and an Associate Dean of Social and Ethical Responsibilities of Computing. She directs the Interactive Robotics Group in the Schwarzman College of Computing at MIT. Does that sound about right, Julie? That is, that is right. Thanks. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, excellent. So, and of course, the reason why we are here today with Laura and Julie is not only because they're experts in topics that we traditionally discuss on Singularity FM, such as robotics and artificial intelligence, drones, etc., but also because they have a, an interesting new book that recently came out uh, called What to Expect When Expecting Robots. So, Laura and Julie, welcome to Singularity FM. Thank, Thank you. So you. Much yeah, it's great to be here. Fantastic. So, let's say that we were in the good old days that we had this ancient archaic thing called a conference, in-person conference, and we were to meet somewhere in the halls of that conference. And I never knew anything about you, never read your book, which of course I read, I read your book and I watched your TED Talks. So how would you introduce yourselves in a sentence or two to someone who's never heard of you before? Perhaps Julie can start. Sure. I'm happy to start. So, um, so I'm, I'm a professor at MIT. Uh, I'm an AI researcher and a roboticist. And um, my, my team and I, we, we, we focus on developing AI uh, that's able to model people um, to make robots better collaborators, better able to integrate into human teams and work with us. Um, and uh, yeah, and so, and so in, a, you know, in a short phrase, that's, that's what I spend the majority of my time uh, thinking about and working on. Fantastic. And can you tell me a little bit more about, because you're an associate dean of social and ethical responsibilities of computing. So I can see how you have the sort of the roboticist end of things, but where does the social and ethical uh, part uh, of your expertise come from or interest, if, if you will? Yeah, so I, I, can, I can talk a little bit about, you know, my, my interest that, that led me into that role. Um, so I've worked for many years in uh, robotics for, for manufacturing. So developing and deploying robots that collaborate with people that work alongside people to build planes and build cars. Um, and uh, you know, it, when we think about introduction of these technologies and future of work, there are very, very substantial social, ethical policy implications and considerations. Um, and, and one sort of uh, framing of a one, one sort of motivation for it is to think about how we can be intentional about doing things differently. So rather than thinking about de deploying robots that replace people, thinking about how we can enhance or augment human capability and well-being. And so, um, uh, so I could talk more about that at length, but obviously the challenges <laughs> that, that we have uh, before us are, you know, are related to future work, but also you know, many, many other you know, social ethical considerations just with computing more broadly. And so, um, uh, it's sort of a, a responsibility for all of us to think about how we um, how we grapple with the, the impact that these technologies can have, the scale of their impact 
uh, and how we bring that back, you know, as technologists on my part, uh, thinking about, you know, how, how that influences how we conceive of technologies, how we design them, thinking about impacts and testing and deployment. So it's something I'm, I'm very passionate about. Yeah, and uh, so we are together for that reason too, because the whole point of my show for the past 11 years has been precisely that. Uh, not, not so much the how, uh, but the, the why or even the so what. Like why we should use something and then so what? What happens after we've used it? The how, to me as a philosopher, the how has always been an interesting sort of an engineering technical detail, but the bigger questions are always why or so what? But it's time to bring Laura into our conversation. So Laura, how would you introduce yourself uh, in a couple of words? Who is Laura Major? Yeah, so so I'm an engineer, um, and I've been focused on designing autonomous systems um, in a way that can better collaborate and, and interact with people for my whole career. Um, this started at Draper Lab, where I, I did this for industrial applications, um, then expanded at Sci-Fi, where we focused in on a, a specific product that we were moving out of, you know, military applications and into, um, you know, broader industrial applications. And now, you know, as the the more um, that I've focused on on that topic in these industrial environments, I saw the opportunity to take, you know, the lessons that we had learned over decades across, um, you know, aerospace applications um, in factories, take the lessons we learned there and the techniques we learned there and use those to help in the commercial sector where we're now starting to bring these, you know, robotic and autonomous system capabilities into helping everyday people. And so this is what led me ultimately to autonomous vehicles and to um, my current position at Motional, where I'm, I'm the CTO leading our engineering development, our technology strategy for creating, you know, a commercial driverless system. So uh, you decided that drones are kind of not a big enough challenge for you and, and therefore decided to go with cars, which to the non-expert like me, seem to be much, 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 much harder to make than drones. Is that not the case? So I wouldn't say I, I left drones, um, you know, because I, I thought cars were harder. Um, it, it was more an evolution, I think, kind of of my own personal journey. Again, I had focused in industrial applications for a long time, looking at, you know, space, uh, um, space applications for autonomy, looking at drones, um, you know, but I'm, a, I'm an aerospace engineer as my background. Um, but ultimately, I saw this opportunity growing in the consumer space, and um, and autonomous cars was uh, you know is one example. But I think there we see delivery robotics. We see now we're seeing cleaning robots, sanitation robots, um, you know, broad spectrum. Uh, but I saw this opportunity again. I had been deeply working in the industrial sector, and and um, you know, again, we had a lot of lessons learned there that I saw some of the same mistakes happening in the commercial sector that was trying to, you know, adopt and, and really progress some of the technology that we'd been using for decades in, in say, aerospace. Um, I saw some of those same mistakes happening. Uh, we cover them in our book. And and so that ultimately the book project is, is um, part of what led me to want to go into autonomous driving to, to help make sure that we do it right from the start and that we, you know, we don't just create um, an autonomous system, we create a safe autonomous system that's going to integrate, you know, with the people that, that are going to inevitably surround it. Um, so that was, you know, I was drawn to that, um, to move out of the industrial sector and into the, the consumer side, because I saw that I had a lot to bring and a lot of, you know, again, hard learned lessons that I thought could make a big impact um, on this new, um, this new area. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the big picture of artificial intelligence and robotics, and then we can so, sort of zoom in and narrow it down to see what we can expect when expecting robots and see how that book and the ideas in that book kind of fit within that big picture. So now, first of all, let me ask you, and this time we'll start with Laura, let me ask you, what do you ladies as experts and professionals with years of experience in the robotics and AI industries think that are the major challenges or problems or big issues uh, that we are grappling with right now within, let's say, robotics uh, or even artificial intelligence? Yeah, wow, that's a big question. There, there's a lot that we're grappling with. Um, 
But I think, you know, I think the, the real crux of the question that you're asking is, what are some of those barriers that we have to break through to get to the other side where this can become more of a reality and less of a proof of concept? Um, and so for me, um, you know, that comes well, down to... Well, let me just, just interrupt for one second yeah. here. So the reality part of it or how to make it a reality is one issue. And that's the, the sort of the engineering challenge. But I'm thinking also about the challenge posed to us by people such as Elon Musk. He says that bringing, uh, that creating an AI is like calling in the demon. Uh, Dr. Stephen Hawking said that, uh, you know, it's the end of the human race. Uh, people such as Bill Gates, Steve Wozniak, uh, and many others have made headlines around the world with similar, uh, you know, snippets. Some of them taken out of context, but many of them adding up to the same thing. So at least it would seem that one of the big issues before we get to how to do those is whether we should do those, whether that's a good thing, a reasonable thing, or ultimately a suicidal, self-defeating thing. Because Elon Musk was talking about the horror movies where a bunch of kids get together to call in the demon. And that was the metaphor that he used in talking about artificial intelligence. Yeah, I, I can jump in. Um, you know, I think if that's okay, yeah. I mean, um, you know, uh, I think there is unease about, you know, what this technology can do and, and what it can become. And I think that's, that's well founded, you know? <laughs> I mean, we really need to be grappling with these um, issues right now. And there are these sort of existential questions um, and there are these uh, sort of more grounded, near-term potential threats that this technology poses too. And, and we, uh, we would do good by, uh, you know, uh, working through as, as we are and, and, and trying to address both of those right, right from the sort of earliest part of, you know, the development of these technologies. I think for me, it, it comes down to asking the question of, well, what, what, is, what is AI suited to? And what is what is our human, um, you know, our human ability that's that's really unique, and at least in my personal opinion, will will remain unique for some time. Um, and uh, you know, I think one of the key distinctions is that you know our, our our unique human ability is to take an unstructured problem and structure it. Once we have a structured problem, AI it can. Uh, you know, AI can like crush it, <laughs> and you, but but it's very easy to overlook all of the ways that we structured the ability of AI to solve many of the problems it's solving today. Uh, from labeling data, that's structuring the machine's understanding of the world. From uh, um, uh, from the the ways in which we choose to collect data, that's structuring the machine's problem of the world. And just to bring that in the context of a, a robotics problem. Um, you know, recognizing objects in a scene when it's sort of framed by a person taking a picture, we naturally frame objects of interest, right? But you let a robot roam freely around and you try to identify objects in your home, the, the video stream is not framed to attend to, um, you know, aspects that are, that are important to us and the problem becomes much harder. So we, um, we structure um, uh, these problems for AI and for robots today in ways that sometimes we don't fully um, fully really appreciate. Um, and so I think the, the real question for me is one, like um, how, do we be, how do we become intentional about structuring problems for AI so that they can help us in new areas where we urgently need help, not just where it's easy to, to use them currently. Um, and then uh, how do we develop AI uh, and robots? Like how do, we, how do we conceive of their use in a way that's a value to us and, and uh, break free of this idea that, you know, this is, this is technology that's just on some, some unmodifiable path and we just have to deal with the consequences of what unfolds because that's absolutely, that's absolutely not true. We frame the machine learning problem to start with. Um, we frame the robotics problem to start with. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's my short answer what to that. What about you, Laura? Question. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great answer, Julie. And um, if you, you'll see in our book, we cover that topic, you know, and Julie and I think have been talking through that topic for years now of, of how can we further, you know, add more structure to our world and more structure to our technology to, to allow, you know, these solutions to, to take on those tasks that maybe are hard for us to do. You know, driving is a good example where, 
there are still, you know, a large number of, fat of fatalities due to, you know, drowsy drivers or drunk drivers. Um, autonomous vehicles offer the opportunity to, you know, avoid that or to, to reduce the number of fatalities on our roadways. Um, but it does require exactly as Julie describes this intentional structuring to make the problem solvable by a machine. I, I think both Julie and I feel like you know, it's not about AI taking over every problem in our world. It's, it's really about, um, again, designing these intentional solutions that, um, that address things that are hard for people to do and designing them in a way that can collaborate with people so that people can continue to provide that, that structure, that direction, that guidance to the, the robotic system, the AI system. Um, but it's, it's about, you know, that, that sort of complement between people and the automated and autonomous technology. So uh, I get that you're both for uh, sort of enhancing ourselves rather than replacing ourselves. And your book talks a lot about that and we'll get into that um, in, in a minute. But just to be clear, so you think that those kind of concerns are overblown or unrealistic? Perhaps you agree with, I think it was Andrew, Andrew Ng who said that worrying about uh, uh, danger, the danger of AI is like worrying about overpopulation on Mars. I, so I, I, I would not say they are overblown. Um, I think it's our, it's a danger for us not to be asking these questions and be concerned about them right from the beginning. Um, I personally um, am deeply concerned about the near term challenges we're going to see, not the sort of ex existential threat, but the, the near term threat of, um, you know, uh, you know, our, our, our sidewalks sort of blanketed with, uh, you know, systems that don't understand us as anything much more than kind of objects uh, and you know, the, uh, the safety risk posed by uh, these systems when we don't, um, when we don't uh, design for them and don't design them specifically to integrate and understand our norms and our, the ways, the ways we are human in our everyday world. Um, and, you know, I think uh, we, we need everybody worried about all of these things and thinking about constructive ways to, to, to move this from, from worry or talk to, um, to bringing the right people at the table to understand how we, how we address these challenges. Um, and so, um, but uh, our book is very much focused on, um, you know, these sort of near term challenges of integration of the technology and how we can maybe leap over some of the, uh, I mean, like fatalities, like, you know, <laughs> that we've seen in other industries where we really learned some very hard earned lessons um, on, on how to design an effective human machine partnership that, uh, that it's time for us to translate. Uh, and, and okay, so perhaps now is the time to kind of start going into your book a little bit. So let me ask you this. I mean, my favorite uh, sort of foundational idea that you start the book with, and that totally makes sense to me, and in an ideal world, that would be our general approach, is that robots and people or humans are good at different things. Therefore, the reasonable thing, the logical thing is to simply focus on our strengths. Where robots have their strengths and their advantages, we focus on that. Where humans have theirs, we focus on that. And then we focus on how we can make it all fit together as a team, as uh, Julie has a, a very nice uh, a TEDx talk about uh, how to use uh, robots as our teammates, so that then the final total outcome would be not one of competition, but rather than cooperation. And so we're all better off in the end. So I totally like that, but let's roll in and zoom first uh, a little bit further. Uh, what is the overarching thesis of your book? If you have one in a sentence or two, what's the main argument? So, um, I think that, you know an overarching theme, or you know at least one of the main arguments, is that um, in in trying to you know envision what uh, what robots, what we call working robots, can do for us, what this technology can do for us in the future. One, this is not a technological uh, sort of technology only uh, issue, um, and that we will never quite get there. We're always trying to get there, but we will never quite get there. Uh, if we if we think about this as a, a challenge of making the technology better, 
Uh, but much, much like every, you know, any complex system, we have to engineer the whole system. Like we have to, you know, in our air transportation system, there are many aspects of that that need to work together. They need to be designed to requirements, you know, so that they're compatible. Uh, we need to think about how we redesign um, our infrastructure, sort of the way our society functions, but also almost how we sort of uh, conceive of how we're going to interact with these systems as something different, like something that's not fully human capable, but something that we need to work to understand a little bit so that we can almost at a personal level, but also at a municipal level, at a um, societal level, uh, you know, adapt and change so that uh, so that this technology can be as useful as we want it to be. So this is, um, uh, this is, you know, the book is has equal emphasis on uh, making technology more capable uh, as it does on uh, making us as humans more capable of working with the technology and making society more capable of incorporating it. Very well. So engineer the whole system together uh, to work as a whole. What about you, Laura? What do you want to add to that? Yeah, I think exactly that. You know, this, this is... Um, a departure from how consumer products have been designed in the past, that now we have these complex, you know, these, these robotic systems are complex. Um, this is no longer, you know, your Alexa, um, you know, that, that you ask questions uh, from. It's something that, that moves, um, that has, a, you know, potential to pose um, danger to people around it. Um, its decisions are, are safety critical decisions. And so that complex system has to be designed um, in a new way that that factors in the, you know, the people that it's going to interact with, whether they're co-located or remote operators or bystanders, uh, has to be designed from the beginning to factor in those interactions and to um, design that, that system as a whole that includes the technology and the people as, as one integrated system. I totally agree with you both on that, but let me push back here a little bit uh, because I watched a very interesting, uh, I think, TEDx talk by Julie, where maybe it was even titled so, or, or at least the main argument it seemed to me out of it was that machines can make us better humans. Is that correct, Julie? Well, uh, I think we should ask ourselves, like, what is our goal? And um, is that is, is that a goal that we should strive for? Because then, then other things follow from that. And I think in, in some contexts, I think uh, you know, I, I think in, in other industries, we have shown that that's, that's the case. Uh, I mean, um, uh, human pilots are able to fly inherently unstable aircraft that would not be possible without a very carefully designed human machine partnership. And so, um, and, and we, there are all sorts of benefits, the benefits that, um, uh, that, that come out of that, uh, that success. Um, and so, uh, you know, what is our goal in these other aspects of our lives and, and how do we design to that goal? So you see, I totally agree with you. Uh, you know, flying computers make pilots better, better pilots. And probably you wouldn't be able to fly any of the modern airplanes or even commercial planes without flying software. And, you know, the same applies to ABS, uh, uh, you know, systems in our cars. The same applies if you're a crane operator, you're a better crane operator if you have actually a crane than if you don't have a crane. So the robot crane, especially with some intelligence so that you don't smash into the building next to you or something like that, makes you a better crane operator. Where I'm still failing, though, is to make that jump to a better human. And that's where I'm pushing back. And here's what I mean by that. You're talking about engineer, and I'm, I think I'm just quoting from a minute ago, engineer the whole system. And your whole book is focused on engineering the robots. What about engineering the humans? We are supposed to be working as a team. We're engineering the robots to be as best as they can be. What about the humans? Aren't we supposed to engineer better humans? Let me give you one example where, where you know, better robots don't do any good. There was this case of this nutcase pilot in Germany who flew a perfectly good airplane into the side of a mountain. I think he was coming back from Barcelona or from somewhere in Spain. Um, and for a number of psychological and other reasons, he, instead of committing suicide on his own, he decided to take a whole airplane with him. Right, so maybe he was perfectly competent as a pilot. Maybe he was perfectly flying a perfectly, you know, flyable, uh, viable airplane with perfectly operating systems. 
And yet the totality of that complex system put together brought the death of probably something like 162 people, if I remember, or something like that. And the problem was not an engineering problem, was not a technology problem, and it was not a flying capacity or uh, capability problem. It was a human problem that destroyed the whole system because that was the flaw in the system. And so my concern is that if we're focusing exclusively on the engineering part of the AIs, the robots, and we are kind of not bringing along the engineering of the human part, the whole system, even if the robotic part of the system works flawlessly, we can still end up crashing into the side of a yeah. mountain. Yeah. And uh, so actually, you know, we, we, fully, we fully agree with you. <laughs> and in fact, um, I think, you know, many, many avi aviation accidents are attributed to human error. Many automotive accidents are attributed to human error. Uh, but, you know, I'm also, my background is also aerospace engineering. And um, uh, one of the uh, human systems engineering classes that, that I took and that we teach, um, you know, a, a common thing we do with the students is actually study NTSB, um, you know, accident reports. And, um, and, and when you, when you look at, you know, the, the, what you see as that uh, terrible tragedy actually has sort of many layers to, to it that, that results in that sort of terrible tragedy at the end. And there's this model that we reference in the book, the Swiss cheese model, where really to, you know, for something like this to happen, you almost have to have all of these different layers, you know, the, the human actions, the technology, but also like organizational, other sort of structural influences. And you have to sort of uh, navigate through all of these holes. It's like highly unlucky, right? And you have all these layers to be able to sort of catch these issues and then your, your accident occurs. And, um, there, there's a there's a human aspect to it. There's there's or, organizational institutional influences as well. So, um, for example, um, you know, in some in some fields, um, uh, you know, uh, seeking help for sort of mental health issues is discouraged, right? And that can have um, implications for your for your career. That's an organizational influence that um, could set you know set you up for uh, sort of a terrible tragedy of of the of the type that you're you're referencing here. And so actually when, when, when Laura and I sort of talk about we need to design the full system, it's also thinking about these larger societal sort of contexts. Um, uh, and um, uh, yeah, and so I think we're, we're sort of in full, full agreement. There really is no um, sort of simple engineering solution for many of these things. Um, and humans are complex. What does it mean to make a better human? Well, <laughs> that's an, an ill-posed question unless you're, you know, uh, looking at you know one specific aspect of you know what makes us well, us... the study of ethics is exclusively focused on that specific question. Sorry, say that again. The study of ethics is specifically focused on the idea: what does it take to make a better human? Yeah, yeah and if I could add to that, I mean, I think Please. the um, yeah, I think that you know our view is is that um, you know robotics and autonomy AI um, is you know if we design it properly, it can be designed to provide more protections, um, plug you know more of those holes that that Julie referenced in the Swiss cheese model um, to to guard against you know areas where humans may make. Um, bad decisions or make errors uh, without intention. Um, and certainly, I think what we see over time is that, you know, we, we plug some of those holes, we try to plug as many of them as possible, and we advocate for in new applications to look at analogies and other applications to not have to find those holes, but to, you know, try to predict where those holes might be and how we can plug those from the start. But then, Absolutely. In, in real life operations, new holes pop up that maybe, um, you know, weren't in, intentional, but um, you, you mentioned the one that, um, you know, suicide into the side of a mountain. Certainly, you know, that probably was never imagined by the designers of that cockpit automation that, that a person would make that, that type of, um, you know, in some ways, a, a failure mode of a person. And he even um, locked out his co-pilot, uh, uh, sort of, pushed him over to go to the washroom, then locked himself into the cockpit. Then the other pilot desperately tried to break into the, the door, but they are all hardened now since 9-11. And so he couldn't break in. And by the time, like, it was over. Mm-hmm. 
But I can also say, you know, I think and there are many great examples where technology maybe has helped, um, you know, prevent these these fatalities. I can say having studied, you know, air traffic control for a period of time um, in, in that case where you so in some ways those air traffic controllers are like remote monitors of these, auton- you know, these complex systems that are piloted, but still they, they are responsible for the safety just as much. And, um, you know, having, you know, things like TCAS, the traffic collision avoidance system in place to catch, you know, um, things that, that the air traffic controller may have missed helps preserve uh, mental health and helps save lives. Um, so there are certain, certainly, you know, always new things, new failure modes that we might not predict, um, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't try. And um, I think that's our, our big message is that when designing these autonomous systems, it's critical that from the beginning, we think about what are the the potential holes, the potential failure modes that could happen, and how do we build in these layers to, you know, crossing technology, people, infrastructure, um, you know, remote operation? How do we build in those layers to try to protect against those failure modes so that, again, we, we don't have to rediscover those? And and when we do discover ones we that weren't seen before in this application or another application, then, you know, then we, we fit, you know, try to come up with a, a new solution. Um, but again, for you know, for me, it, it, it's it's not enough to say there will always be additional failure modes that that you can't predict. It's still the responsibility um, of the technical community to try to design solutions, and not just the technical community, the policy community. Um, you know, all all the people that are involved in creating the environment for these autonomous systems to be as successful as they can be. Let me push you a little more here, though, because I don't think we're quite talking about the same thing here. And the key word here is failure mode, right? What is a failure mode? Because my concern is that the system can be flawless in theory, not that in in reality it would ever be. But let's say in theory, there's no such holes that you've mentioned. It's flawless. It could act perfectly as designed, and yet it could lead to our ultimate destruction. And, And what I mean by that is this. Take nuclear weapons. You can have a bunch of scientists, the smartest people around the world, Oppenheimer, uh, you know, you name them, all of them, right? And they can design the best possible system to, let's say, prevent accidents. Let's say prevent uh, mistargeting. Uh, And yet, if the system works flawlessly, when some human presses a certain button, we would all be dead. And the system would have worked flawlessly, and yet we would all be dead. Why? Because the system, we are talking about a total system where the robotics, the mathematics, the physics, the chemistry, the, the sort of mechanics of it, everything works, and it delivers what it's supposed to deliver. What's supposed to happen, happens. And the outcome is we're all dead in the end. And so you have a system which ultimately works as designed, but the outcome of that system is to say the least suboptimal. It's kind of like game theory, right? Absolutely. absolutely. And, and the, yeah. the weak link of that system is presuming that your uh, robotics and AI end of it works flawlessly, which is a big presumption, to be honest. But let's presume that the weak link of the system is humanity, is what I'm trying to say here. And therefore... I'm concerned when I see some expert like you who is infinitely more knowledgeable than me who says machines can make us better humans because from my philosophical point of view, garbage in, garbage out. And I'm concerned that technology acts as a magnifying mirror and we can see the effects of it even right now today as we speak during the American election. We saw it during the past American election. Right, You have this super powerful technology, you name it, AI, social media, the internet, nuclear weapons, physics, breaking the atom apart, uh, you know, quantum mechanics, space flight, and you can say, you can send rockets to Mars or you can send them at your neighbor. And that's not a malfunction of the system, that's a malfunction of the human end of the system. So my concern is that if you're building a such system, which works flawlessly and you're not concerned about the human element, should you not be a little more concerned about that? And should you not take some responsibility? Because Oppenheimer, for example, became a pacifist and said it was all a mistake in the end, 
right? And now there are people who are saying that AI and robotics are equally powerful, Elon Musk being one of them, equally powerful as nuclear weapons. They're the nuclear weapons of our age, and they can save us, save millions of lives. You know, as you said, 1.2 million people die in car accidents around the globe today. You have, especially if you're in Canada or in the US like we are, we have better ch chance to be killed on the road than anywhere, anywhere else, pretty much. And yet, the downside is if we get it wrong, we can end up somewhere pretty bad. Yeah, I think, I, I mean, I think you're bringing up, you know, uh, you know, a key point here, which is, you know, there's there's one uh, there's one lens that we you know we need to put on to to think about what happens if uh, with the technology fails, what what happens um, if it doesn't perform as we expect, are we um, how how are we addressing that? And we do spend um, a fair amount of uh, you know effort in the book, um, you know, uh, working through and thinking through how it is you know humans can shore up the you know the capability of the system uh, as well as vice versa. Um, but then there is, you know, this, this separate question, which is equally important um, uh, to, to ask and address at the beginning, uh, which is what happens if your technology works exactly as you expect um, and, and, and it exceeds your wildest expectations about what can be accomplished by developing the system or deploying the system? Uh, and then, and then what happens then? Like how, you know, how, what are the ripple effects of this? What are the ways in which this technology can be repurposed for different uh, tasks or applications than the one you initially developed it for? Um, and, uh, you know, at, at MIT, we're, um, you know, putting on my associate dean's role in the, in the college, in the Schwarzman College of Computing, we're, uh, we're working to, um, uh, to deeply embed social ethical policy questions and considerations into the technical curriculum. And these are these are actually questions that we ask our students. So, uh, you know, not, not just what happens if the technology fails, but what happens if it succeeds beyond your wildest expectations. And in, in fact, one of the prompts that we give the students is, you know, what, what Black Mirror episode would you write <laughs> if, you know, if, if this technology was, you know, as absolutely successful as it could possibly be. And it's it's important to uh, bring you know you know our full technical creativity, but also our creativity in thinking about these possible outcomes and consequences um, as sort of a key part of the bread and butter of what engineers and technologists do. And so you're uh, I think you're you're spot on that that's an equally you know big threat. And so now I'll just ask the question for Laura and I to banter and think about. You know, I think like uh, in, in part, I think the book is motivated by asking the question, like, um, what if these systems that we're now seeing, you know, security guard robots, sidewalk delivery robots, uh, robots in our um, in our grocery stores, uh, are are you know end up being so like wildly successful? Uh, so first of all, we we spent a fair amount of time talking about like you know why they might not be and how we need to get on <laughs> designing these systems so that they are so that we can see their benefit, but. Um, at these systems um, sort of deployed at scale in all of these different sort of pockets and aspects of our life can have uh, can have you know very significant negative consequences. Right? Questions from who has access to the technology, who benefits from it, who is differentially impacted, where are these technologies tested, say for say. Um, uh, and, and, you know, maybe if it's, uh, I'd like to joke, you know, if it's one Roomba, like hitting your ankle in your living room, like, you know, that doesn't understand you, doesn't see you, it's not, you know, like you're, you're probably not going to trip over it and everything is okay. But once it's 10 Roombas across your whole house or, you know, similar systems, like in effect in some way, or they're kind of bumping into you. Now you have like a, a bigger problem and it's not just an annoyance problem. It's, um, uh, you know, so, um, you know, I think, uh, in large part, the questions you're asking were uh, the original motivations of um, uh, in the seeds of the book. Yeah, and if and adding to that, I mean, I think you know we are big advocates that the policy um, and you know standards around this technology needs to be built side by side with the as the technology evolves. Um, we see that if you look back again in, in air transportation, there's an international community established, you know, to really figure out the right standards, the right technology um, solutions to some of these these bigger threats, um, you know, in air transportation, it's, you know, it's the 9-11 scenario. It's the worst possible scenario. Um, but, you know, there were, again, these layers of protection built in to protect from even, you know, 
flaws in, in, in humanity. Um, and so I think, you know, again, that we need that sort of side by side development of, of policy, you know, that that is informed by the international community um, that sets that foundation for how this technology get you gets used, what protections are put in place, and maybe more importantly, how it how it's not used. You know, we think about with, when you look at a lot of these, let's say, delivery robots, you know, there's a there's a, a new threat of, from a cybersecurity risk. Um, a delivery truck is a closed loop system. It's controlled by the person who's driving that system. So you put in protections to make sure that person is well trained and is well rested um, so they can safely operate the, the delivery truck. But now, you know, if you have a delivery robot that's controlled through, through a network, through the cloud or a cellular network, and um, there's an inherent, you know, cybersecurity risk. It's something we, we take very seriously, emotional, um, but there aren't, you know, there aren't um, as robust um, methods or, or discussion around topics like that yet um, that, that, again, we advocate that those are the kinds of things that we need to grapple with and, and figure out before they become a problem. Very well. Let me ask you, because you just mentioned motion, mentioned motion and, and that's very interesting cutting edge work that's been taking a lot of headlines in the last couple of years. Uh, most notably, Elon Musk again proclaiming multiple times that we would have self fully autonomous self-driving Teslas by 2020. So I think we are in 2020. It's almost over. Where are the self-driving cars? And if fully self-driving cars, I mean. And if they're not here yet, when can we expect those? Because, you know, as, as Peter Thiel once said, you know, we were promised jetpacks and, and you know, <laughs> we, we got 140 characters. So his buddy Elon promised us self-driving cars in 2020. And last time he said something like that was maybe a couple of years ago only. And yet yes. just yesterday I was watching a Tesla fail the most winding road down in San Francisco <laughs> multiple times. Nice. Actually, which was a very cool, interesting video. So what about that, Laura? How, yeah. Are we are they here? And if not, when should we expect them? Yeah, I mean, look, I think, you know, so developing self-driving cars was maybe harder than uh, first expected. Um, what to expect, you know, the expectations were not properly calibrated. Um, I think we have recalibrated as an industry, um, again, um, and me, for me, it's it's also looking in other industries um, that I do think that this is the year, and we are starting to see that, that uh, we will see driverless technology at small scale. You know, I think it's not a problem that you wake up one day and it's solved. Um, it's, you know, you start with a focus, again, back to Julie's point earlier around structuring the problem. So you start with, you know, a set of use cases, um, we call them ODD and the operational uh, domain description in, in, you know, autonomous driving, but you start with lower speed. You start with, you know, areas where there's maybe more structure around the intersections, fewer, you know, no, no school zones, uh, for example. So fewer vault, maybe vulnerable or unpredictable pedestrians. Um, it, so it's not, again, it's not like you're going to wake up and it's done. Um, if you look at what others are doing, it, you know, it's happening in sleepy town, sleepy suburbs. Uh, we have a driverless um, capability we're working on that, that will um, be complete by the end of this year. So we're starting to see companies pull the, pull the safety um, operator out of the driver's seat for the first time this year. Um, but my perspective, it's only the first part of the journey to truly realizing you know, driverless systems at, at, at a scale that's going to have the kind of impact that we imagine it, but it's, but you have to take a first step to get there. Um, and so this, for me, this is the year of that first baby step. And um, I think over the next couple of years, you know, we plan to have our first commercial driverless um, system, in, you know, developed by the end of 2022. Um, so it's really, you know, it's a, it's a process. Um, and when we look at other industries, that's usually how it's gone. It's never been, it's not like you wake up one night and it's done. Um, it's more about taking those steps to, to getting there, starting very structured, ex expanding to less structure over time. But um, again, um, let me ask you, know. you just to clarify what you mean by driverless specifically, because uh, 
there's many different definitions and then we'll move back and actually talk a little bit about what do you mean by robot and what do you mean by artificial intelligence because those are yes. important terms. But let's talk about first about driverless or self-driving car. What exactly do you mean by that? And once you define that and you can both take a shot at this, uh, what's the timeline that you project as an expert in the field that we would be expecting one or many? Yeah. So driverless, yeah, you're right that not all driverless is the same. When you hear of companies talking about full self-driving, that I think that's Elon Musk's term, FSD. Um, so when I, so driverless means um, you have a vehicle that's fully, you know, in control of all the safety critical functions of driving that vehicle. Um, now it still can get, you know, it can have a um, somebody who's monitoring either in the vehicle with a big red button to stop the car behind the vehicle. You often see um, the thing that isn't noted in many of these articles is there's often a trailing vehicle with, again, a big red button ready to stop if, let's say, you know, a kid chasing a ball runs out into the street um, or you can have a remote operator. But driverless means that, you know, the, the driving task is fully um, being, you know, uh, the safety critical part of that is being closed you know, by the autonomous system on board. Um, now, we, we have an autonomous system that's in operation today um, on the Lyft network in Las Vegas. Um, there's a safety operator there. So they, that's a more, um, high, there's more supervision um, in that task where you have a person who's ready to take over, um, you know, the steering wheel if, if needed, if let's say there's a tight cut in by another vehicle or, um, you know, something along those lines. Um, so you, so it's a progression. You start autonomous where it, it's driving itself, but you have higher level of supervision. And then you, you start to um, pull the, the human supervisor, you know, further from that integral driving task um, as you make progress. Julie? Yeah, I think you know this is the, the, this is sort of the, the natural progression of the technology. I mean, I I think of the analogy to a human driver, uh, you know, do, doing driving school. And if you remember the, uh, you know, you may remember way back when, but the um, the sort of instructor when you're learning to drive has a break <laughs> over in their passenger seat. You know, it's sort of and you start by bringing the student to uh, easier, lower traffic places where they're familiar, and you sort of build up. Uh, the skill set sort of step by step. Um, and so um, I think this is a process we're very familiar with being a pilot. Sorry, go ahead. So when can we have the student without the instructor, without the instructor, without the brake? Because to me, that's what self-driving car or driverless car means or should mean because I, like on purely linguistical basis, from a language point of view, driverless means driverless, means there shouldn't be a supervisor or an inspector. That's the ultimate goal I think we're going for here, right? So how far are we from that? Yeah, so I mean, today, um, you know, I think, as we mentioned, this is sort of the, the year where we're seeing these dri truly driverless um, systems start to you know, start to become a reality and, and, but you can't remove the person with their foot on the brake uh, or ready to, to hit that red button, whether it's again in a remote operating center or trailing car, you don't want to do that until you gain confidence, right? You need to drive a lot of miles with this driverless system before you're ready. Just like with a human driver, you know, we, we teach them, we, we, they go through tests. They, um, you know, we have similar things in, in engineering where we go through a lot of validation and the, actually the, you know, it's, there's a lot of rigor there. Um, before you would want to, to remove a, a human supervisor from being able to, uh, you know, intervene. Um, and, uh, and just, to, you know, again, this is the pressing the brake is much different than taking over the steering wheel and performing part of the driving task for the system in a manual way. Um, so I think it, it's a part of the progression. Um, so if you're asking for my prediction, when do we remove that, that uh, brake pedal in the, in somewhere in the, in, in the loop, um, you know, I think that probably is likely to be still a ways off. I, I would say a couple of years. I think we need to see this technology in operation, get 
get a lot of um, experience with it, uh, have results, work through some of these kinks we talk about in terms of, you know, people interacting with these autonomous vehicles and, you know, rare scenarios that you only that only pop up when you uh when you experience a lot when you have a lot of exposure of the system you know to to a dynamic world um only then is it responsible to remove you know a human supervisor from being able to you know monitor and and stop a system if in case of a, an unexpected situation do you agree with that couple of years julie i um I, I I hope so. I, I I think it's I think it's I think it's possible. I think in my mind, you know, one of the key challenges is that um, when you're you know when you're you're uh, a flight instructor or a driving instructor and you're uh, you know you're you're trying to gain a sense of the capability of your student, you know that that student is another human, which is likely to make the same errors or have the same uh, or does have the same sort of. <laughs> You know, underlying hardware and software that you do, the same biases and heuristics, um, and uh, and that sort of usually has a lot of experience. You know, learning the learning curve of another human. Um, and this technology, I think, you know, we don't we don't have that same experience with the learning curve, and the errors it makes are maybe rare errors and maybe very different than human errors, uh, and that makes it very hard to think about like licensing or you know going through the same process that a that a human would go through to sort of certify the capability of another of another human, uh, and I think these are these are challenges that that we absolutely need to address. And there and being able to address them is going to transform the entire field of robotics and the use of these systems in society. So I'm not I'm not of the the camp to say like this this can never be done. I think this is something that you know uh, you know companies like Laura's are you know leading on, uh, and I'm very very eager to uh, and you know there's there's excellent excellent work in academia on sort of trusted autonomy and uh, verification and validation of these technologies that is going to move this field forward rapidly too. And so, um, uh, I, you know, I don't think we would have written, written the book if, uh, I wouldn't, I would not have written this book with Laura if I <laughs> did not think that this was coming imminently. So. Imminently. Yeah. You know, uh, I love, first of all, I agree with you that that's a, that's a good problem and it's an important problem for us to solve because as we mentioned, 1.2 million people die. That's not even mentioning, the maimed and the other injured people and, and you know, time saved efficiencies and, you know, endless benefits of, of actually introducing that kind of a, uh, improvement. But the reason why I'm pushing so much to define our terms is, is that so that we can kind of better judge your guesstimates. And here's why I'm doing that. You know, I, I wrote in the one of the first, if not, well, a, the first one was a Mercedes in the 80s, so forget about that one. But I rode in a, in a Prius in 2011, which was at the time probably the first self-driving car in the United States or in North America anyway. Um, and the experts that were showing me that car around and explaining the LiDAR and all of that, which was basically a modified Prius uh, at the time, were kind of giving me the same estimates that you are giving me now, a couple of years. Right, and that reminds me to the fact that Marvin Minsky famously said that computer vision would be resolved by a, an undergraduate uh, summer uh, student, uh, you know, o over the course of a summer, right? And and within you know a handful of years, we would have solved basically the problem of artificial general intelligence, right? And here we are, fifty years later. And the reason why the definition is so important to me is because I disagree with you as per what self-driving car means. And here's what I mean. I think you guys are engineers, so you're cheating your way out of the problem, which is totally legitimate. But if you put the LiDAR, a bunch of sensors, if you pre-drive the course a thousand times, and if you include all kinds of infrastructure worth billions of dollars ahead of time to make your car work, that's not really solving the problem. That's like cheating yourself out of the, the, the problem. To me, no, a self-driving car... I'll push back on that. Yeah, sure, yeah. So, sure. Just, so... just give me a second. To me, a self-driving car, I would recognize you have a self-driving car. It's not if you take me on NASA's Ames campus and you drive me around in a Prius in 2011. But if you take that car in Bombay and you drop it off on the road with no traffic regulations, with a donkey, with a, with a bicycle, with, you know, a little scooter, 
with uh, cows everywhere, with no police officers, with no registration, and a million things happening unpredictable all the time. And if you are able to drive from one part of the spot or, or in the middle of the desert, if you will, or in the jungle or something, and if you're able to do that kind of driving, I'll be like, here, now we have a self-driving car because that's what it means to me. So, Where I mean, am I wrong with this? I think, yeah, I mean... Um, if if that's it's if that's how you frame your goal, I would just push back and say that that's not that's not the appropriate goal because um, you know I, like do we do we um, do we let you know sixteen year olds out on our street and and obscure all of the uh, you know traffic lights and you know tra <laughs> traffic signs and you know lane markers and uh, do we take away their GPS and their map and then say uh, okay, this is how we know if you can really drive. Like we 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 design uh, we we develop our infrastructure to support you know a safe transportation system, whatever transportation system that is. Um, I've, I've you know yeah, I've, but you both have worked for the military, and you know that soldiers have to be able to make do with maps, not just with GPS, right? So they have to be able to make do with technology and without technology. They, they also train very, very intensely for that specific purpose. And so um, if that is uh, if that is the ultimate objective of what we need of this technology, then we then we develop towards that. But I think it, it, it creates uh, sort of a very long horizon under which we can expect to see the benefits of that technology when it's uh, it's our bread and butter to um, you know, to, to, to design like rules of, you know, develop rules of the road, set up infrastructure. We're constantly, um, we're constantly refining, you know, crosswalks, right? <laughs> uh, and like bike lanes to, as you know, as we see, you know, terrible accidents unfold at them. This is, there's a constant sort of revision of, um, of, of this, the structure that we give to even our own sort of human uh, behavior, um, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and I think we need to expect that we need to do that same thing for these systems to be able to make use of them um, as, as we would hope to. And frankly, as, as I, you know, I would have hoped we would have been able to in this pandemic when it's, uh, it's unsafe for, you know, uh, so many people to, uh, to, you know, to be doing things out, out and about. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think if we had gotten on this, you know, even a few years earlier, <laughs> and so let's 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 make it happen for the next pandemic, shall we? <laughs> yeah, and I think that's for me a part of this journey. You know, you've and we, I think we cover this sort of timeline of like automation invasion. Where did this all come from? And it's you know that vision that you paint of take a vehicle that we developed here in the U.S. and drop it in into any country with completely different maybe instead of you know, right-hand driving, it's left-hand driving and, you know, any, any sort of, um, scenario, um, and donkeys on the road and new, new kinds of, you know, um, scenarios that, that weren't envisioned from the start by the designers of the system. Um, that vision is very far off. Um, it's, but it's not like we, we won't have anything until we get to that. For me, it's again, this, this sort of journey you have to go through that that's ultimately, yeah, where we'd all love to be to have this general solution that can apply that you design once and it applies anywhere. The reality is we're far from that, um, that, that I'm certain of, um, we start with very, you know, geographically focused, um, area. And again, these are, it's a safety critical system. Um, this is, you know, it's dangerous if it doesn't perform flawlessly. Um, if it doesn't have a good understanding of its environment and the rules of the road. Um, and so all of that gets encoded into how we build the technology, where we train it, uh, what data we use to train the system, what what's the decision-making hierarchy, all of that is a part of the solution. So it starts with a very structured, um, you know, focus on a geographic region, a, a set of use cases, um, and then you again you you build it from there. You start to generalize it. Okay, maybe now it, it can do any urban setting in the United States. Okay, now maybe it can do any highway, any road in the United States. Now it can do you know any urban setting in you know a certain part of the world. You 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 build it up over time. It, it's not like a again kind of a single solution that solves all problems at at once.
And I might just jump jump in to add to, I've heard sort of echoes of the argument you're making, you know, over uh, large portions of my career working in human robot interaction. So, um, you know, sometimes, you know, you think of, you know, designing for human robot interaction almost as the cop out. It's like, you're almost giving up on the technology. The technology can't do it. So let's make it easier for the technology by bringing the human into it. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and, and for me, uh, I think, I think there's a place for trying to develop technology that's more independently capable, but ultimately human robot interaction is the goal, right? So we're designing for the goal. We're not, we're not trying to, uh, you know, take some easy route in, um, you know, and, 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 in, in or a shortcut in, um, or sort of giving up on the, on the technology itself. And I think we make an argument in the book that that goal of human robot collaboration is so sufficiently different than the goal of an independently capable system that unless we're thinking about that at the beginning, we won't, we won't achieve this benefit we're hoping to achieve from these systems sort of integrated more broadly into society. But the question then is, and that's where the, the importance of definition is so important and the importance of goals. That's why I always say the why and the so what are the most important questions, not so much the how, to me at least, right? Because the goals are crucial here, right? And here we have clear differences of goals. And and I think it's not unreasonable to presume the following. You know, uh, John McCarthy defined AI as the science and engineering of making intelligent machines to the point that they would be able to perform equally as humans. And so extrapolating that, uh, you know, into the car realm with self-driving cars. And by the way, the crux of that uh, issue we have right now is also the crux of the issue that European Union has with Elon Musk and why they cranked up on his claims about autopilot and self-driving. And they rated his car very high, the highest actually, but they said he's overblowing his self-driving and all autopilot, right? Because the presumption is that if you take a human being and you drop them in Mumbai, or you drop them in Latin America, or in Europe, they'll be able to drive on a road they've never been on before. And the presumption is that artificial intelligence would be equal or better than humans. And the presumption is, so you tell me where my law uh, logic is failing here. And the presumption is that a car, self-driving car would be equal to a human driver. So if a human can drive in North America, they'll be able to drive in India. Maybe not perfectly, not flawlessly, but they will be able to. But the problem is that if you have a car that drives only in North America and not in India, then that's not a self-driving car. That's a car that drives in a very specific context, in only one specific condition. I've been to India. My husband's family is originally from India. I've driven in North America. I have, I have been in a car on the streets in India. I could not drive there. I don't understand. <laughs> like as far as I could tell, there are no rules. There's there's clearly norms and my an point. There to navigate those intersections that I do not understand. My <laughs> and point, AI precisely. cannot be expected to do it either safely, right? I mean, at least as safe as as people do it without any sort of structuring of that problem, without any sort of data on on how folks drive in that in, in that area or, or or some some other sort of structuring or priming of the problem for it. I don't think that's that's the goal for us. I don't I don't see why that ought to be the goal for these systems, uh, because there are so many other goals that could add value so much in the near term, um, but that that are not easy. Like <laughs> there are like deep challenges associated with these sort of safety critical systems on our on our everyday roads, even when they're navigating the same neighborhood day after day. Um, that we don't want to miss, we don't want to, you know, be looking at this sort of far, far off goal, which is a good, which is a good reach goal to maybe advance technology, but uh, miss, miss the, you know, key things we need to be working on now to, um, to make this technology something that's useful in the near term. Okay, so let's move on from here. Uh, let's talk about some other definitions which play an important role here. And let's ask, what is a robot? Because your title is all about robots, what to expect when we're expecting robots. So first of all, what is a robot? How do we define one? And do you have that definition in the book? Did I miss ah, it? Ah, so let's see. I will give you, I will give you what the IFR, the International Federation of Robotics definition of a robot, I think is a system with, I think they say three, three degrees of freedom, three axes. It might be four. I usually I, I refer to you know something with four. 
Uh, but is an, is an airplane a robot? In my view, yes. Is a smart home a robot? Uh, I, I say, you know, yes, yes, it is. So, um, you know, systems that are in, in, that that uh, have embodiment and that act in our world, that that take an information online, act in our world. We're talking about intelligent robots there. You know, it, you know, you can have sort of a standard industrial robot that is not intelligent, that's not necessarily uh, responding to its uh, environment in, in a dynamic fashion. But for Laura and I, I think we're uh, the book is is focused on what we call kind of working robots, robots out in our streets, in our homes, in our workplaces, embodied systems uh, taking in information about the world. Uh, and acting physically in it. Laura, do you want to add anything? Um, no, I don't think so. I mean, I, and I think one, you know, one of the, uh, coming back to our, our previous discussion, I think, you know, um, a robot uh, still can have supervision um, by by a person. So, you know, Julie mentions an intelligent robot. There are certainly remote controlled robots. Um, we're really, you know, not as focused on that. We're more focused on as you pull people further and further out of those inner control loops. Um, so now you have the human really transitioning to being, you know, a supervisor or a bystander in many cases, um, and that can be co-located or remotely located. Um, so there's different, you know, forms of supervision based on, you know, kind of the capabilities and the intent of, of the robot's objectives. And did, did I miss that definition of robot somewhere in your book? Did I miss that? I, I I do not believe we, we pull the IFR definition of a robot. In, or any the... definition for that matter. Isn't that strange? You, you're writing a book on robots and you're not even defining what a robot is. Um, well, uh, I, we give lots of examples. We give lots of examples <laughs> in the book, which uh, describe the, the, the components of a robot, uh, certainly. Yeah, I've been talking about numbers of degrees of freedom or... <laughs> Yeah. Here's why I'm pushing for that here, okay? Just so you understand my biases. I've done 260 of these. And generally, they're very much about artificial intelligence, robotics, etc. And I've done all kinds of uh, experts. Among these 260 interviews, not two definitions of artificial intelligence have overlapped so far, right? And uh, Marvin Minsky, Ray Kurzweil, I talked to Professor Stuart Russell, who says, of course, well, the definition of AI is in my book. My book is the standard textbook. Go and read it, right? And I was like, and he got quite upset with me. Well, not quite, but a little kind of annoyed by me by saying, look, but I've interviewed 250 other of your colleagues and not one of them mentioned the definition from your book, right? And, and my concern is as an outsider, you guys are all insiders, that when you're defining things that mean different things to different people, you're talking past yourself. And that's less true about robots, in my opinion, but more true about AI, because AI is so, so vastly different. Because like people say, I work for Google in their search engine, and I work on AI. And people say, I work in aerospace industry for AI, in cars for AI, in, you know, uh, uh, object recognition, voice recognition, and everyone works on AI. But it's got nothing to do with anybody else's AI. And so they talk past themselves what, what's actually AI. And that's why if we want to actually have a conversation, we have to make sure we're talking about the same thing. And that's why I like to pull out of people, if I can, a definition that we, so that we, the outsiders, get an idea about what we're talking about. Absolutely. So I guess uh, I have I have a story that I tell to my students, but I may as well just tell it to you and the whole world. On this, <laughs> so when I was a when I was a brand new grad student, just starting in the field of AI, I went to a, a, a conference, and I remember at the end of I don't know the second or third day, there was this plenary session, and it was uh, it was it was labeled something like "What is AI." And I, and, I, and I thought to myself, this is really great because if someone asked me to define AI, I'm kind of new in this field. I'm not sure what the precise definition is. And so I went and I sat down. I'm like ready to take notes. And then what I realized are there's, you know, uh, a few people who are the top in the field and they're up there debating the definition of AI. And I thought to myself, oh, my gosh, they don't even know what the definition of AI is. <laughs> and so um and I think that's sort of a, you know, I, I, and, you know, I'll just add, you know, one other, uh, one other story or joke, which is, I was also, this was also told to me, you know, when I was sort of brand new in the field is that uh, AI researchers always kind of have a little bit of a chip on their shoulder because we're always working on something that almost works. That's what we call AI. 
But the moment something works and it becomes sort of embedded in society, like it doesn't matter if you know the field spent decades working on it, nobody ever considers it AI anymore. It's like, oh, that's not AI, uh, you know. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I think uh, I think grappling with this, this definition, and there 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 are some that um, some some definitions that I sort of refer refer back to, but they're they probably wouldn't be satisfying to you because you know, like what like what what makes something uh, AI? It, you, you you there's no there's no simple linear sort of scale for that. It's sort of multi dimensional. It's like a calculator AI. Well. Uh, you know, it's it's a matter of scale, right? And of the particular dimension you're considering it on, especially if you're uh, overlaying that on, you know, and your comparison is human intelligence. Um, I think it's just, a, it's a complex question. It doesn't lend itself to a, a very simple and easy answer. And that's why we revisit it so often. And that's why, you know, I wanted to ask to, to find out if it's deliberate or, or kind of random that there's no definition because Gary Marcus, for example, deliberately did not put a definition of AI in his latest book. Uh, but speaking about the, about the book, Laura, can you tell us who your book is intended for? Who should read your book and what should they expect to get out of it? Yeah, that's a great question. And it probably comes back to this, you know, why didn't we include the robot definition question, which, you know, we, we grappled when we started this project with who should we be trying to reach? You know, we had a lot that we wanted to share with detailed, you know, engineers who are in research scientists who are working on these problems, you know, in great detail. Um, and, so, you know, we grappled with, is that our right audience or is it a broader community who, who might, you know, might be CEOs, might be um, users of this technology, might be policymakers. And we ultimately went with that, went that direction to have a, you know, to make the book accessible to a broader audience who has a general interest in technology, um, but also tried to include some nuggets that, that would also um, provide, you know, some, some new contributions to the detailed um, technical audience. Um, but yeah, we assumed some basic understanding of, of robots um, in our, in our audience. We assumed people would pick up this book if, if they had an interest in, and uh, were, were enticed to learn more about uh, what's happening with robots today and, and where are they going next. Um, so I don't, you know, I think we, we dived and, you know, we focused our, our deep dive instead into here are the different parts of a robot. Here's how, you know, the different levels of supervision a person can have. Um, those were more the areas of focus rather than building a found, like a, an initial foundation of what is a robot. Um, we, we assumed, again, that our readers would have a general understanding of what robots are, but want to learn more about, okay, we've been hearing about them for years. They're going to enter our, you know, our world. Where are they? And when are they coming? Um, and what is it going to mean? What's it going to look like? And, and we wanted to break down some of those um, previous, you know, notions of what these robots might look like. You know, they, they're not going to look like another person. They're going to look different. Um, and they're going to do things, you know, they're going to be designed to, to do a task that's going to help you or should should be designed that way um, rather than, you know, something that's going to be social and, um, and you know, really replace a human in your world. It's, it's instead there to, to help people around them. Um, so, um, yeah, that was that was our we were trying to reach a broader audience than just engineers. So the two uh, in the interest of time, because I know your time is very precious. So we probably have the last 11 minutes here of our interviews of our interview. So uh, the two favorite things that I took from your book are, I already mentioned the first one, was the, the fact that robots are good in, uh, in one thing, people are good at another thing, and instead of trying to replace one with another, we should just focus on the, the system and engineer the whole system, as Julie said, and focus on our strengths and focus on the team building aspects of both parts of that. So I love that. Uh, and the, the takeaway note at the end was that, quote, we believe that what to expect when you're expecting robots is that they will not work for you anymore, but with you. So I, I love that too. Uh, and that's very well said. But talk to me a little more about the dynamics here of this statement and about the likelihood about this. Because just yesterday I was reading uh, a piece uh, from a bunch of previous uh, ethical or insiders or whistleblowers from places like Facebook and Google who basically wanted to create a derivative of that so that we work with social media, Facebook, YouTube algorithms, you name it, uh, 
and it works for with us instead of for somebody else. But every time they try to do that, the systemic uh, setup of capitalism and uh, of a corporation makes it so that that's literally impossible. They run into the corporate wall. And so you can say, well, it's all nice and, and, and good to enhance humans, but you can say the market incentives are to replace humans. And in your book, you give a lot of examples about, or you mentioned, and Julie, you mentioned in your research to scheduling software, you know, and we know how scheduling software is supposed to make things better and easier and, and so on. But we also know that, you know, the New York Times had this huge article about cloponing in Starbucks. And that's that was eight years ago, how women are close to are forced to close and open at five o'clock on the next morning and how people are cut off at 30 hours uh, automatically so that they can't get any benefits. And all of that things now being automated with the software. Right, and eight years later, they did a follow-up, and nothing has changed. Even though Starbucks very publicly went and said on the record, "We're going to change this," and it, they didn't. Right, so again, example of smart software supposed to work uh, uh, with us, and yet it doesn't even work for us. It works for somebody else entirely. How do we change that? Because that's the biggest. To me, the the issue is not technical. The issue is commercial. It's uh, systemic. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I think I think you know uh, you're again raising uh, you know I think key points that we do uh, touch on in various ways in, in the book, and you know just. Um, there are uh, there are you know incentives. Uh, there are. Um, uh, you know, pr particular, you know, goals behind the development of technology. There are winners, there are losers associated with it. Um, and it's not just a technological issue. Um, you know, I think one of the, uh, you know, one to of me, the... To me, never is a technological issue. That's the whole point I'm pushing for the last 11 years, right? And that's where, where, where we're kind of disagreeing on. It's never about the technology. At the end of the day, it's always about something else. Look at Vietnam, look at Afghanistan and Iraq. All the technology in the world didn't help any one bit. Trillions of dollars didn't help one bit. Only hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people dead. In the case of Vietnam, millions of people dead. And we had a feudal country that was at war with the biggest war machine in the history of the world. Didn't help either. Yeah, and I think our counter example again is, is air transportation. There's again the international component, a lot of cooperation required, a lot of infrastructure, a lot of investment, you know, globally. Um, and yet, you know, air transportation is one of the, you know is the safest uh, mode of transportation today, even though it relies heavily on cooperation, um, humanity, a lot of people doing the right thing, making the right decisions. It's not flawless, you know. Unfortunately, nothing is, but. Um, but I think it's a great counterexample of where, you know, um, technology can be designed and, and deployed in, in very helpful ways to, to society. Um, and so that's why we kind of use that as, as our anchoring um, analogy of, of what, you know, we should learn from what, what went well there. And, and you talk about capitalism and, and, you know, kind of the motivations and incentives, um, you know, in in tech community tech companies and we saw this in air transportation you know the creation of the faa happened because you know you had the um you had the, the ceos of the airlines and the and um, the aircraft manufacturers come together to say this is what we need we need cooperation across the community safety transcends competition in in this case and the only way to get there is you know and, and i guess my personal belief too is that companies who get this and who uh, you know, think about that and factor that in from the beginning will succeed ultimately. That these things, maybe they don't play out initially, but they play out over time. And, um, you know, and, all, you know, the people who, again, the companies who are thinking this way and pushing in this direction, uh, you know, will, will succeed in the long term. These issues are, are absolutely intercoupled with the technical issues as well. So, uh, you know, I, I think as we all know, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, data is, uh, you know, a, a key aspect to uh, developing these systems. It's not the only aspect, um, but it is a, is a key aspect. And, you know, in the aviation side, when there's, um, you know, when there's an incident of some sort, uh, we have mechanisms for sharing, sharing that information through uh, anonymous reporting systems. 
uh, that are you know a key factor in the in increasing safety of our of our air transportation system. Um, but we don't have that mechanism currently, for example, for one, uh, you know, one manufacturer of one robot system or autonomous vehicle to be able to, uh, uh, to, to be able to provide uh, the relevant information around some incidents so that another company uh, can learn from it. And there are many, you know, this, this requires a, a public private partnership of some sort as, as you know, as it, as it has for, you know, aviation and other industries is, is you know, is, is, you know, what we, um, you know, what, what we, uh, you know, indicate in the book, um, but there are deep technical challenges with doing that too. It's not as simple as a, a pilot, you know, reporting on a, on a form, the, the context around the, um, you know, the, the occurrence, uh, because, uh, you know, the data sort of captured by one vehicle is intrinsically linked to the sensors and the capability and the algorithms of that vehicle. And it's not easy to set up a new test case for another company to sort of, uh, try to prove out that their system doesn't have sort of a similar flaw. And there are, there are AI and AI engineering challenges associated with even making something comparable to what we do in aviation today possible on the, um, you know, on this sort of, you know, robot side. You know, aviation industry, I have to kind of give you half and half there because I just watched the whole documentary on Boeing and about how they knew all the problems ahead of time with the seven, what was it, seven three seven max, uh, and uh, even the in, the safety inspectors were internalized or outsourced from the uh, supervisory agency to the to the Boeing company, which is to say their bosses were would tell them if they are allowed to say that the plane is unsafe or not safe. How the whole system was designed to hide all those issues. How after the first accident it was hidden how after the second accident there was a very serious attempt to hide it still again and only due to a number of other factors did it came out to light and when it came to light it was much worse and much more of a systemic failure than a technology failure and most of it came to cost cost of retraining pilots uh, and and also uh, admitting that there were design flaws to begin with right uh, and finally take even the black box example that technology is so ridiculously obsolete and we have technology to replace it today very easily and cheaply and yet we cannot find agreement so that we don't actually have to go and dig out the plane out of the bottom of the ocean to get the black box but we have a real-time live upload of every time everything that's happening on the plane right we still can't find that inter-industry cooperation so th those are my concerns so I can give you half and half on that I don't know if you agree with me but unfortunately, we're running out of time here. So I want to ask you the last two questions. And first is, where can people find more about you and your work? Because I think uh, what you do is phenomenal, despite of the fact me pushing back. Uh, and I think you would be the ones who would be sort of the decision makers and the creators of those technologies, whether in the civilian uh, industry or in the military realm, quite often, as you both, I think, have or do work with. Uh, so it's beneficial for people to follow what you do because you do important work. Where can can we find more about you and your work? Well, yeah. So for for those that would like to learn more about you know what what we're up to at MIT and in the lab, um, uh, you can follow me on Twitter. Um, yeah, I have a, a lab webpage, um, interactive.mit.edu. Uh, and you can also follow, um, you know, the very exciting things we're doing in the Schwarzman College of Computing um, uh, in our uh, in our initiatives and programs around social and ethical responsibilities of computing. Um, and so, yeah, there's I, I think there's increasing ways for all of us to to get involved and help try to make the the future that we that we want to see with these technologies. And you, Laura. Yeah, and for me, um, same, you know, social media on Twitter, on LinkedIn, um, we, we do have, you know, we, we try to be very proactive about sharing um, developments and, and news um, out of Motional. Um, so certainly the Motional website or also on social media, um, can, me or Motional. Okay, so the most important question, the takeaway. We've been talking with you for, let's say, an hour and 30 minutes or so. What's the most important thing that you want to send us away with? 
whether about what we should expect when expecting robots or anything else related to robotics or artificial intelligence or even technology in general. What's the one thing that you want us to remember from this conversation with you? So let's start with uh, Laura. Yeah, so I mean, I think for me that the one key takeaway is that um, you know, it's these these big long term questions of uh, where will this all lead and when will we get there. Um, those are important, very important questions. But I think our contribution and our focus, at least for this book, was more near term. There's a lot of work to be done here and now to get this technology off the ground and get it integrated into society in a way that's helpful today and in the upcoming decades. Um, but certainly, we have you know, these longer term issues to to work through, but our contributions is really about how do we create that, you know, human system uh, partnership to get these systems to be effective and safe in our everyday world today. Julie? Yeah, I, and I think I just add to Laura that we we all have a role to play, like not just us as uh, technologists or academics or those um in industry and not just, you know, policymakers, but literally every one of us, um, uh, you know, uh, needs to be uh, working and thinking and contributing about how we, uh, you know, what we want to see of these systems and, uh, and, and we're the ones that will be the bystanders of these systems, we're the ones that will be interacting with them. Uh, and your you know, every every individual voice and every um, you know ev- every one of us has a very important role to play both in the success of these systems and ensuring that they uh, provide us value. And I sure myself hope that things will turn out as you hope and work towards in your book that we all end up working more as a team, both robots and humans, but even humans with humans. <laughs> so that we all end up in a better place and we are better in the end rather than much worse off as many experts like Elon Musk and others have have been sort of worrying worrying us about. Julie Shah and Laura Major, thank you very much for being with us today. If you guys enjoy this show, you can help me make it better in a couple of ways. You can go and write a review on iTunes, or you can simply make a donation. 